Conspiracy theorists aren't the only people who suffer from bad logic, poor reasoning, and critical research failures. Everyone falls victim to these logic traps and logical failures. It's just that conspiracy theorists do this in funny and relatively harmless ways. Conspiracy theorists are just the tip of the bad logic iceberg. There are plenty of other subjects where bad logic, poor reasoning, and critical research failures do cause harm and do cause problems. I know you're thinking, politics. Yes, let's, let's talk about politics because not everybody else is doing that. That's original. That's really exciting. That's something I really want to get into. But there is something I have noticed. It's not political. There is a group of people that are, I do believe, is falling subject to this and it's spreading. Now, since I'm a space-based discussion channel, I'm going to give you uh, three really good guesses as to what I'm talking about here. You know the people watching this at home have probably already read the title, right? That's not a guess. SpaceX fanboys? Wow, you're good. Good morning, everyone. I'm the pressure-fed astronaut, here to take on space hoaxers, moon landing deniers, and to talk about aerospace engineering while doing so. Which is funny, because I'm not going to be talking about either today. I thought we were doing a Russian vid destroying SpaceX. I'm, I'm Slav squatting here, and putting on, I was going to put on a bad Russian accent for this. What, what the heck? I changed my mind. Uh, the Russian vids video would have been boring. We're gonna act it out. I'm Russian vids. Not actually Russian. Here's SpaceX launch footage. It's so fake. That's not fake. Why do you think it is fake? I say it is fake. Because it is. I'm probably mentally ill. Ta-da! Instead, I've decided to talk about something I think is more compelling. SpaceX fanboys? Yep. Online discussion of space travel has become tainted by the SpaceX fanboy. Endlessly regurgitating Elon tweets and uncritically examining his ideas and plans while trashing anything not SpaceX. It is okay to like SpaceX. I'm going to make that very clear. They are the first successful private rocket company to ever exist. They land boosters, which is really exciting. And personally, I kind of like the Falcon 9 Block 1's aesthetic. Falcon 9's a Zenit 2 clone. Yeah, if you're gonna copy a rocket, at least copy a successful one. And the ultimate goal of getting humanity off planet long term is a great goal to achieve. There are a lot of things you can praise and admire SpaceX for. However, however, there are people who take this a bit too far. Things like calling Elon Musk the savior of humanity, dismissing all other rocket technologies and other vehicles in development as obsolete or dumb because they're not Falcon 9 clones, not doing, not doing what SpaceX is doing. A big one coming up now is dismissing astronomers' concerns over the Starlink mega constellation with Musk praise. Then there's ignoring Elon's personal problems, his labor issues. It's a lot over in that area that it's really messed up. And then just generally calling for SpaceX to have a monopoly over space flight and space travel. These are all things I've been seeing a lot more of, and it's, it's not good. This is just the tip of the iceberg. A cancerous iceberg, poisoning discussion of space travel, space engineering, and all the concepts therein. Now, I am going to note here, there are plenty of people who do criticize Musk's plans quite heavily. But the problem is, from what I've found and where I've gone, these groups generally are comprised of anti-space travel communists. 
I'm not anti-space travel and I'm not a communist. Wait, did that tweet seriously say that Starlink was going to enable off-world colonization and save humanity? Yep. This phenomenally ignorant tweet is attached to a YouTube channel which I think embodies the worst of the SpaceX fanboy. Let's take a quick look. And surprise! NASA needs more money to get back to the moon by 2024. Well, corruption isn't cheap, folks. Oh boy. Before we begin, I'm going to note here right now that the couple we're looking at today, uh, Jishuan, don't get mad at me for pronouncing that wrong, and Sebastian are a YouTube channel based in Germany that talk about all things Elon Musk. And from what I've gathered, their backgrounds are not in aerospace engineering. Uh, keep note of that as we move forward. We talked about the insane corruption that is going on with how NASA is awarding contracts to the likes of Boeing and Lockheed. Swing enemies. Just because Boeing and Lockheed are members of Old Space and part of the military industrial complex does not make NASA's use of them corruption. Will NASA favor a company that has been working with longer and has more proven track record? Probably. That does not make NASA corrupt. Is this the hill I'm going to die on? No. We'll move on. Russell Wald wrote to the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Alabama Republican Richard Shelby, that it would be much cheaper to launch the Europa Clipper mission on a commercial rocket. Using a commercial option would make Europa Clipper's mission to Jupiter six years instead of two. SLS can launch Europa Clipper on a direct trajectory to Jupiter. You'll launch it from Earth and it'll do a straight burn to launch it on an orbit that'll hit Jupiter in about two years. Commercial launchers do not have the same payload capacity as SLS. As a result, they have to perform a mission like this. We launch from Earth, fly by Venus, fly by Earth, fly by Venus, as an example, to build up enough velocity to reach Jupiter. As a result, the mission is going to extend from two years to six-ish years, give or take. Uh, if you want an example of a direct mission turning into an indirect mission with full flybys, look up the Galileo probe to Jupiter. This is a great example of this. And as a result, for a mission like Europa Clipper, you'd have to re-engineer parts of it for this specific trajectory. So when, comparison, when comparing commercial launchers to something like SLS, it's not just a simple one costs less than the other. It relates more to what do you want it to do? LS costs 1.5 to 2 billion US dollars per launch. You heard that right. 1.5 to 2 billion US dollars. B billion, like. 1.5 to 2 billion dollars sounds about right, uh, depending on how you slice it. Now, an actual SLS vehicle, the rocket itself, is about 870 million dollars. That's the you know, RS 25s, the tanks, the batteries, the wires. The other billion comes from the infrastructure and support. Right? You gotta have a factory to build SLSs, you gotta have a, a place to test SLSs, you gotta move them, you have a workforce you should pay. That's where the extra billion comes from. Then you gotta amortize out the R&D costs over the launches, which is something to take note of here in the future. And also, just to, for reference, the Saturn V cost more per launch if you've taken the entire cost of the Saturn V program over its 13 launches, cost a bit more than 1.5 to 2 billion, and the space shuttle was about that much too. It was you know, 1.5 to $2 billion a launch, depending on how you sliced it. So SLS is gonna cost about the same as all the rockets. However, our good friend Richard Shelby doesn't want to save money because as you know, a large part of the SLS rocket is being assembled at the Marsh Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And of course, if suddenly missions like the Europa Clipper would suddenly be launched much cheaper, then SLS would be completely obsolete and that of course would mean a lot of jobs lost in Alabama. A NASA rocket built at a 
NASA facility dedicated to propulsion and rocketry? This is a twist no one saw coming. No one. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you on a little, little secret here. There are other aerospace programs in Huntsville. The problem is, this is at a time when Boeing is capable of producing one SLS per year. Like one, one, this, one, one per year. Yep, big complicated machinery takes a long time to make. Cars are a few thousand parts and they could be built in a day thanks in part to automation. Airplanes have a few million parts, so they take months. A big complicated rocket would also take quite a long time to build. And then don't forget, uh, the first one's always the hardest. So once you start making more SLSs, they'll be easier to make. Teething and all that. Compare that to Starship launching three times per day. But one, you didn't say how long it'd take to build Starship. Two, Starship hasn't been built yet. Remember when the space shuttle was supposed to fly once every two weeks? But it didn't. Three, uh, the space launch market isn't big enough to need three 100-ton launches per day. And it's, likely, it's unlikely we'll ever see that in our lifetimes. Or ever. In fantasy land. Sure. Of course, in an ideal world not ruled by corrupt politicians, which unfortunately is not our world, uh, of course they would scrap SLS altogether and go full Starship. Ah yes. Scrap SLS because having a viable deep space launch platform that has admittedly some political and management issues is dumb. Here's a hint, here's a thing. If we were to cancel SLS, Artemis, Orion, all that, we'd be canceling our, pretty much our only serious plans for leaving low earth orbit. Yes, Musk talks about it, but he has provided nothing to actually support it. And no one else talking about it has done anything. So in reality, you're talking about killing our deep space program again. And your definition of corruption is NASA not bound down to SpaceX? You know what? Let's just do a fun comparison between SLS and Starship just for the fun of it. So SLS will cost 1.5 to 2 billion per launch, will not be reusable, that is 100% non-reusable, will have in the block 1 configuration a payload capacity of about 95 metric tons to LEO, a bit more than 26 tons to the moon, and as we found out, can fly an impressive one time per year. Those numbers are accurate, no need to be condescending, though the emphasis on reusable doesn't make sense. Considering that SLS is going to fly once or maybe twice per year makes engineering it to be reusable kind of hard to justify. Plus, the real issue here is SLS is designed primarily as an interplanetary launcher, a deep space launch vehicle. The core stage, when it burns out, will be at 161 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. It'll be in space. To put this into perspective, uh, Falcon 9 stages at less than half that, since it's designed for low altitude staging to bring the booster back. That's why the second stage is so big. Making SLS reusable would be rebuilding SLS. It's pointless. And how does Starship compare to that? Well, it will cost two million per launch. That number is pure excrement. I don't know where Elon got it. Because if you consider things like amortizing your R&D costs, infrastructure support, insurance, propellant, launch pads, building and maintaining them, that is, things like paying your employees. Starship will just never cost that little. It's really impossible for that. So I don't know where Elon got that number. I'm gonna assume he just made it up. Because he probably did. We have a LEO capacity of more than 100 tons, probably around 100 tons to low Earth orbit, plus minus. Ah yes, the 100 ton Cilio market. I've done a detailed market analysis of this. It's on my whiteboard. Go take a look. It's blank because there's not much need for a 100 ton commercial launcher, especially one that can't do much past low Earth orbit. A payload of 100 tons to the moon thanks to orbital refueling, even 100 tons to Mars with orbital refueling, and... 
Oh, and the re orbital refueling technology that, it, that uh, Starship needs to work uh, doesn't exist yet, except for a few test articles at NASA Glenn and a bunch of angry engineers going, why can't we have our test flight? That's it. You can fly three times per day. Per day. Three flights a day doesn't really mean anything for a rocket that doesn't exist yet, supporting a launch market that doesn't exist. So a thousand times per year. So Starship will be one million times, thousand times thousand, more efficient than the SLS. That's how insane the difference between Starship and SLS is. It really is a factor of one freaking million. Carrying what? And where'd you learn the definition of efficiency? These numbers don't mean anything. It's really easy to compare a rocket that doesn't exist to one that does. Insane when we remind ourselves again how much more efficient Starship actually is compared to the Senate launch system, or should I say, the Shelby launch system. Ah yes, the effective engineering argumentation style of making up condescending names. Big fake rocket. See, I can do it too. And Starship would be the perfect solution to get humans back to the moon and also to build a moon base from the beginning. However, they don't like Gateway because of the mythical corruption that exists at NASA. I'm not really going to talk about it since it's not really an SLS Starship comparison, except to say that Gateway, while a political move, is a great option for deep space research without actually being in deep space. You're outside of the magnetic field and you are in that environment, but if anything goes wrong, you're three days away from coming home. Is it political? Yeah, but it's better than nothing. Time we have SpaceX and Starship. So probably it doesn't matter in the end what will happen with the Gateway. Starship doesn't exist yet, except as a collection of tanks in the field and CGI. SLS? Done. Orion? Done. Contracts have been awarded for Gateway and for Lunar Lander Studies for Artemis. NASA is not going to cancel all of that for Starship because it's not done. We don't know, they don't know, if it's gonna fly in the way Elon says it will, or if it'll do half of anything Elon says. It's not worth the risk. If Starship comes online in time for Artemis, sure, and it can do the job, sure, we could use it. But for right now, we're going with what we have in the real world. That the only real option NASA would have for returning to the moon by 2024 would be to utilize Starship. I guess these two don't read much because SLS is still the only realistic option for returning to the moon by 2024. SLS is done. The core stage is at Stennis being tested. It'll be assembled at Kennedy at the end of this year and fly next year. I've seen its second stage in person. And the second SLS is on its way. Starship, so far, has hopped and then blew off its locks dome. And there's no real timeline for when things will be done and tests will be completed. It all exists in Elon's head at this point. So... Even though we find it a bit strange that the most impressive of those lunar landers is the last one. You yeah, but the other landers are more realistic. Ah, yes. The second way to make good engineering arguments. Display images of these different landers and play condescending music over them. Should we discuss the merits, the goals, the missions, the feasibility of these other designs? Pah. This was a fun comparison. A great comparison! If you don't know anything. Oh, Mr. Fancy Pants, you think you can do a better one? Comparing SLS and Starship is actually quite a challenge because there's a lot of factors involved in comparison of the two vehicles, more than just a superficial table like this. There's a lot more that goes into an actual comparison than just this. I can compare payload capacity to low Earth orbit and then launch costs, real or imaginary, all I want, and draw conclusions based on that, but that's not really what we want to look for in a, a real comparison. So what I want to do is not a straightforward SLS versus Starship. 
Instead, what I want to do is a critical look at Starship while making some comparisons with SLS and ways SLS beats Starship. So this will be a critical look at this. How's that sound, guys? Yeah, no one seems to be talking about how unrealistic Starship is. Dude, this video's long enough. I know what's gonna happen next. You're gonna ramble in front of the whiteboard for three hours talking about propellants, and then block half of it. Okay, we'll do that, uh, but in the next video, though. What you saw was just a teenth of how, what online space discussion has turned into. And with it, you can see all the horror marks of a conspiracy theorist. And this includes the condescension, which I've edited quite a lot out. But like conspiracy theorists, Jishuan and Sebastian start with a sort of conclusion at the beginning, go back and look for sources to support their claims, and only those, and lo and behold, these sources are also horrifically biased. They fail to do most research, they dismiss criticism, and then with this bad information, they jump to bad and ignorant conclusions. Now, unlike conspiracy theorists, this kind of ignorance is harmful because other people will watch this. Other people will read these things and take them in and believe them to be true. And then they'll regurgitate these things for other people. It'll spread. And that's a problem I have. And this channel does a lot of it. And this again, this isn't all what they do. There's a lot more. If you want to compare SLS and Starship, please do more research than reading Elon's tweets and then articles written by a guy who hates NASA and SLS. Or, just wait till my next video. I'm the pressure-fed astronaut, not a NASA or Boeing shill, since I know one of you is going to try to come up with that as an excuse. I don't work for either of them, but I do work, but I do work next to them. Next time, we'll be explaining to everyday astronaut why SSTOs don't suck. Yeah, thank you all for watching. Uh, if I made a mistake or done something wrong or you want me to focus on something different, uh, leave a comment or, or just comment. I'm so lonely. Also, uh, last time I asked you what this was, and it's an expander deflector rocket engine. It's like an aero spike, right? So the ones that, you know, are a spike where the, the nozzle makes half the engine belt and the atmosphere makes the other, so it's altitude compensating. Well, expander deflectors are like the opposite of that. The bell is normal, but the injector head altitude compensates. It's a neat system. So for next video, What's this? And, you know, till next month. Bye.